Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Andre Ospina and John Quint. The question we're going to try to answer today is the importance of understanding and training internal capacities. Um, and before we get started, rather than me butcher functional range systems, could you talk a bit about how you got started and where it all came from? Uh, yeah. First off, thanks for having me on on the podcast. It's a real real pleasure to be here. Um, long story short. Uh, I went to school uh, for chiropractic, right? So during chiropractic college, as most people can attest to being in school, um, you're learning things that were important, but I don't know that they were necessarily important to me in mm -hmm. how my career was going to advance. Um, so I think where I started the, the, the system was to start to teach soft tissue palpation. So as a, as a third year, um, I started teaching in the anatomy lab at the college in the cadaver lab. Um, and what I was realizing most uh, at the beginning was that what we were learning was really out of textbooks, right? So we were learning anatomy, how most people learn anatomy, which is to learn dead person anatomy out of a, a cartoon textbook, right? Um, but then as you start to see patients and you realize that your anatomical knowledge uh, on a cadaver or on a piece of two-dimensional paper is not sufficient for the management of a three-dimensional person, uh, I started to teach how anatomy is how it presents in the living tissue, right? How can I teach someone using their hands to assess anatomy uh, rather than the ability to dissect anatomy out? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like there's a deeper structure. Uh, in an anatomy, a cadaver lab, if you're looking at subscapularis, you're removing a whole lot of what I consider to be important tissue, a lot of fascial tissue, a lot of connective tissue in order to get to the, the tissue that you wanted to examine. But in real life situations, you don't have that option, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I started testing, what, uh, training people on was how to locate and to assess anatomy to make it worth your while so that you can make clinical decisions. Um, that kind of ball, or spiraled into people saying, well, if you have these opinions as to how to assess the tissue with your hands, how do you treat it? Um, and then the whole time I was realizing that the, the, the things that I was being offered in terms of treatment uh, from your superiors were just things that are being passed down because that's what they did. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the scientific literature and you try to amalgamate the two, I didn't find a lot of overlap. So what I, I set out to do was to, to not really create a system, but to see what kind of system would emerge from the literature if one took the time to sit with the literature. Um, so I sat with the literature um, as I was, I was training, of course. Uh, and then to me, it was just obvious the things that needed to be done to actually manipulate tissue to cause positive changes. So... I pretty much amalgamated that information into uh, what would later be called functional range release, which is my system of soft tissue assessment uh, and therapy. And that spiraled into people asking the question, well, how, is it that you, how do you assess? Like, what are the overall uh, ways that you assess? And then that kind of branched off into functional range assessment. How do you train? How do you, how do you condition or rehabilitate these people? Uh, and that went into functional range conditioning. And then that went into uh, the internal strength model. But I think overall... Uh, it was the general lack of, um, I wasn't satisfaction. I wasn't satisfied that what we were being told to do was, was really representing all of the knowledge base that was available to us at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the systems kind of just grew out of that decision to answer the questions. What are we actually doing? What is possible to do? What's the most efficient way to do it? Um, and, and, and that's pretty much how the, the system evolved. So now we have areas of the system to cover, you know, the assessment of an individual, the treatment of an individual, the rehabilitation of an individual, um, and then the development of body control, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately I took the term mobility and, and ran with that term at a time where I disagreed with the general um, description or definition of mobility. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short, back when I was, you know, putting these things together, mobility was really thought of as a passive a passive concept, right? Like, uh, can you move into particular, but really the word mobility is not passive, it's active. It's not a matter of development of passive flexibility, but the ability to utilize that flexibility in order to move into the external environment. So that's how I define mobility. Uh, and then of course, in order to have this confidence to move into your external environment, it's not a matter of just acquiring range, but it's a matter of filling that range with neurological intelligence mm -hmm 
and strength because there's no reason to have a range of motion available to you that you're unable to defend or utilize by the production or acceptance of strength. Um, so that's pretty much the, that's the story. And um, yeah. When you were researching and coming up in trial and error, did you have many setbacks or many people who were initially like your peers or mentors going, this is not going to work? Or was it a reasonably easy transition to bring this out to the mainstream? It depends on who, which people we're talking about. When you're, you know, with social media, there's people out that would disagree with the things that you say, um, mostly because there's not ample amount of time to explain to its fullest extent mm -hmm. what you mean by what you're saying. So, of course, you get pushback. Anything new, anytime a, a new person just coming out has an a, a opinion that dramatically changes the fabric of what people are doing, or at least I propose to dramatically mm -hmm. change the fabric, there's pushback, but where I didn't get pushback was at the actual seminars. Um, so I found it relatively easy uh, to explain my points um, because really I didn't go, I didn't have to stray outside of what was already known. So I always tell people that, you know, there's people that tell you to think outside the box, right? Um, but I often thought that the people who were telling you to think outside the box didn't really have a good grasp as to what was in the box. Mm -hmm. So I always set out to take what was in the box and just make the box bigger. So when I'm telling people, this is how I do this, and this is how, and this is why, and I'm giving them, you know, physiological concepts that they would have learned in first year phys ed or, uh, you know, physiology 101, mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't that difficult, to be honest with you. The, the people that I actually got to physically or, or you know, come into contact with and, and teach the methods. Is there any misconceptions people have to date about what FRS and its... Um other courses are that you can see? Yeah, there's a, uh, is there a lot of misconceptions? I would think so, especially in terms of the, the therapy aspect of it. Um, there's a big thing now in, in our profession with regards to therapy uh, where people, you know, they, they assume that what I'm uh, teaching people to do is standard soft tissue work like everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Not understanding that the way that we always saw soft tissue was it's just the priming that would be necessary in order to allow the training to really take hold in the anatomy that you're training. Mm -hmm. um, so I use soft mm -hmm. tissue as a signaling mechanism to start the process of cellular change, which of course cannot happen in a single session. Yeah. So, you know, when people say, oh, this guy's teaching soft tissue, you're just kind of clumped into, you know, the same thing everyone else was doing. like the idea of breaking apart fascia or breaking scar tissue or these are concepts that when, when looked in the literature, they don't hold up. Yeah. Um, and I've always said these things, but you do get clumped in with the people who are, because you know you still get stuff online where people are saying, well, there's research to show that you, know, you need this much force in order to break apart fascia. And, and then I'm, I answer, who cares how much force you need to break apart fascia? That was never the intention to yeah. break apart fascia. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that your body listens and responds to the language of force. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm quoted as saying, force is the language of cells and movement is what you say. Uh, and when you say anything to the body, it has to be said in time, but over a period of time for changes to actually occur. Mm -hmm. like I, I've never really come up with a uh, proof or any anatomical literature that would justify the idea that whatever I do with a client today will create a lasting change in their anatomy. Like to this date, I have never, I challenge people to find me evidence that you can do something once yep. and make a long, a lasting change in the human body. And I think that soft tissue work kind of blurred that line where they, they're, a lot of people are making claims like I'm rubbing away connective tissue scarring or nodding or things like that. So that would be a misconception that I think would be the most. The other misconception I think is the idea <sighs> that with functional range conditioning has been kind of, everything gets grouped in, right? Mm -hmm. It gets grouped into the idea of mobility. So people who are, are used to training hard because that's what needs to be done, um, they might look at that and say, well, that's not hard training. That has nothing to do with strength. It's just becoming bendable um, or, or flexible. But when you actually study the system, you realize that I'm taking all of the concepts that are known to be true with, with strength training, right? like concepts that are irrefutable, the law of specificity and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, a whole number of them, and I'm just bringing them into the micro uh, environment of mobility work, right? Um, so th that's a misconception that I'm, I'm making people bendable or I'm, I'm making people into contortionists, yeah. right? Like 
I, I work with a lot of contortion. I work with a lot of Cirque du Soleil performers, right? So I do work with those people, but I also work with you guys, or I work with, um, you know, Olympic lifters, or we work with uh, any, any number of athletes. And I'm not, I always say that you only need as much flexibility as you, your sport requires, mm -hmm. plus or minus a buffer. But the idea of always capturing control over your flexibility and adding resilience to the tissues that are governing your flexibility, uh, that's strength training. Yeah. Uh, so I think people miss that, that I'm not talking about mobility, like roll on a foam roller, mm -hmm. feel loosey goosey, and then get to the important stuff. I'm turning the focus of training from the external environment of lifting weights and, and producing feats of strength and turning the focus internally mm -hmm. and thinking what anatomy need be in place in order to make those external feats go well and how is that anatomy built? And then when I start to talk to strength coaches and they start to realize, oh, he's using the same methodology that I use externally mm -hmm. in order to cultivate a good internal environment, and then we realize we're speaking the same language. So it's just, it's just groupings, right? You yeah. get grouped here, you get grouped here based on one buzzword, and then it's hard to break out, but... Um, how did the two of you guys meet? Man, you're gonna have to go over that one. I don't even. Yeah, I met uh, I met you first before. So the first course that I took, um, I'm trying to think, it would have maybe been 2016. Was out in Vegas. Mm -hmm. It was FRC uh, at that point in time. So I'm a neuromuscular mm -hmm. therapist, uh, and at that point in time. I was doing continuing education, so I won't mention all the other certs that, that I was taking, but I just continued to take education basically because uh, like you would always leave, like, like, like Dre said it really well, right? Like when you're working in a clinic, it's like what you're taught in school and what you're taught, like what I had been taught up until that point, like wasn't clinically relevant. Like mm -hmm. I knew what I was doing, like there was huge blind spots, right? Like, for instance, if you want to get into soft tissue treatment, it's like there was no assessment. It's like, hey, this is the protocol for this piece of tissue. Can you find that piece of tissue, run the protocol? And you go, well, how do you know if the protocol needs it, right? There was a lot of questions that couldn't be answered. Yeah. So I took FRC out in Vegas was when I first met you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of a nerd like, like you guys in this. So I did all the pre-lectures, took all my own notes. And I was already essentially convinced that like, hey, this is this is kind of what I need to, to, to start to actually systematically give to the mm -hmm. clients that I work with. And then uh, I wasn't disappointed then when I took the course because then actually doing it and practically going through it mm -hmm. and then having a, the training background that I have, you know, and actually training at the appropriate intensity levels, I, I saw results. And then that set me. So I started with FRC. As soon as I get on with FRC, that's when I took FR, and then FR is in upper, lower, upper extremity, lower extremity, and spine. So I took FRC, that was my introduction to the system, uh, and then I went through the FRs, and that was a really good like phase for me because I was able to start to like apply that and change literally my practice, mm -hmm. which completely put my business on a different trajectory. Then after that, then FRA came out, mm -hmm. took FRA, and then, and then just our continual work, then what kind of emerged was the natural consequence of kind of all of that stuff was probably the ISM. The strength course, yeah. Right? Yeah. It was that, but yeah, so essentially since 2016. Mm. You remember me? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to forget a guy your size, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 But yeah. the, the reason why I ask is just a natural progression into when you first said you're going out to your seminar and you came back and I was in the front office here, you made us go through different motions and we all cramped. Mm. And I'm like, what is going on? Then never in my life as a strength coach to that point did I ever think about training someone internally to externally. Mm -hmm. And that right there made so much common sense. That I was like, well, why is this? Now, you learn about the internal. You learn how to train ligaments and tendons, but not a whole lot about joint space. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, this makes too much sense. And then that's when you're like, oh, we're missing a whole big deal here as a strength coach with the assessment. And the more we talked and then going to an FRC completely changed my mind and how you approach training an athlete from a strength coach's perspective. Um, I just thought it was a cheat code. It made our jobs 
uh, a lot more uh, efficient and uh, made athletes training incredible to where we're making huge gains in shorter periods of time and we're giving them exactly what they need. Mm-hmm. And that all came from redoing our assessment. And um, that's a big thing why I wanted to get you up here and to have John with you is to just to show and talk about since 2016, 2017 is when we really implemented into our system of training athletes. I've never worked with powerlifters, but all the pro athletes I had a good uh, involvement with their protocols and assessment. And the assessment was so accurate that it made training the simplest thing we've ever done. Because exercises are just tools you put in to get stimulus in different areas. Um, and that's why I, I was kind of perplexed of why other strength coaches weren't seeing this the way we were seeing it. And that it's so much common sense that everyone should be doing it because as a strength coach, it reduces our liability because the the mitigation of injury is huge. Mm. So we have a, an accurate assessment of an athlete. We know what ranges we can train them safely. We know we can implement max effort uh, loads in the specific ranges. So if you're healthy, we can go full range. If not, we've defined what you can and can't do objectively, not subjectively. And then they're training within three weeks. They're different athletes. Um, yeah. And that's and I'm glad you brought up that it gets clumped in in the mobility and because people just hear a term like, oh, they tired all of the same brush. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, that's not true. And this is a big thing that uh, I would love to, just for people to understand how much this has revolutionized how our system of external training has got even better by understanding the need for internal training and the need to actually work and communicate with therapists. Because I think that's the thing that's lost, especially in the pro, pro settings. And I'm sure you guys have yeah. seen this, that where a therapist and a strength coach both think each other are morons and no one talks and the athlete is the victim of all this. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, I think um, I think part of this, I think part of the, the, the major problem that I ran into is that uh, strength and conditioning, the management of athletes, it's always been, the outcome measure has always been performance. And whether you go back to the, the Soviets back in the, what years are we in now? Like the 50s, I would assume, for the, mm-hmm, that's that right. Olympic run. I mean, really, strength science was, was born out of a desire to increase human performance. And I just believe that the focus was 100% on the performance and n- none of it was on the actual athlete. Mm-hmm. So I often say, like, if you're, I use this example at the seminars, but if you're, if you love kettlebells, right? Like, you just, I don't know why a person would love kettlebells, but just to say you love kettlebells, right? So you, you open up a gym, you, you know, you're, you call your, your name Steve. I don't know why, but you call your place Steve's Kettlebell Gym. As soon as someone walks into your, your training facility, what are you going to do? You're going to hand them a kettlebell because that's what you love. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that we make these assumptions that people that come through the door somehow have control over their internal environment to the extent that we give them an external tool and we think everything's going to be okay, right? So the exercise, you can name any exercise, an overhead press. Do you like that exercise? Sure. You should never say you like an exercise. You should look at the exercise and then look at the prerequisites required for the exercise. Then look at your client and ask yourself, do they have the prerequisites to accomplish this exercise before a decision is made to actually Mm -hmm. input the exercise? But that, that's not being done, Like right? For example, gyms now, if you, you go into the gym, you're put into a class, whatever that is, of like 30, 40 people. And, you know, today we're going to do snatches for time. And then if you would ask me, if you give me 100 people randomly, how many people would you say have the prerequisites in place or the internal control necessary to do snatches? The answer is one, maybe. To do snatches for mm-hmm. time is probably none. Right? So there's this mismatch where we just assume that if you have a good exercise system and the exercises you use are good, then they're good for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but that can't be the case, right? Like a lot of people, you'll, you'll say, put your arm over your head. Something simple as that. I'll tell people, you probably shouldn't be overhead pressing. What do you mean? I've been overhead pressing for all my life. I have world records in overhead press. I go, do you also have TL junction pain? Well, you go, yeah, I have horrible pain. My left knee is, you know, terrible. When the microwave goes on, I shit myself and forget where I am for 20 minutes. Like there's just this whole list of these symptoms. And I go, well, how do you not see that that might be coupled with, with your inability to do the prerequisites you need for an overhead press? Yeah. So I'd say, let me see you lift your arm over your head. 
So the arm is lifted over the head up to about that point, and then you see the lumbar spine extend in order to garner the rest of the range that would be necessary. And then I say, well, you can't put your arm over your head in an unloaded position. So what makes you think it a good idea to load the bar and, and force your arm over your head? Clearly, if you're using your low back to compensate for your shitty shoulder, then when you're doing a shoulder exercise, it's not really a shoulder exercise anymore. By definition, a shoulder exercise has to be done on a shoulder. But if you're telling me you can only lift your arm up to here and you have no rotation in the shoulder, then by definition, I don't think you have a shoulder. Mm -hmm. Ergo, shoulder exercises are not going to go well for you. They become low back compensatory exercises. And then we have this list of, of symptomatology that you have from doing an otherwise good exercise. Yeah. So that was the, I think that was what you were referring to where you have to look at the system that you're working with. You can't just think of the external things you want the system to accomplish without looking at what is actually accomplishing the external uh, movement yeah. or exercise. It, um, it allowed me, like there's many mantras at Westside and with all the influence we have, but a big one is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm. And just because you can do what is perceived as an overhead press doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. And when um, you talk about force in the language of cells, mm -hmm. well, from a strength coach's perspective, and from someone who's not American, so I had to brush up on what uh, football is, what baseball is, what basketball is. Um, this is like breaks through language barriers because you train a person, mm -hmm. regardless of the sport initially. You're like, hey, I now have an assessment to where I can make a footing in, in any sport, any discipline, because you have a human body. And as a strength coach, you want to do that. I think if you specialize in one sport too much, you, you become numb to everything else. But in the private sector, I talked about it yesterday, if you had someone who does fencing comes in, you have someone who does football, you have someone who freaking does skydiving. It doesn't matter. We can have an assessment and work with them because of utilizing the education you've provided and mixing it with ours from internal to external to where we have an assessment, first of all, as a human being. Mm -hmm. Are you functioning on that level? And if not... What does your sport require? So through objective data, this all comes together. And uh, I haven't seen a situation yet by having these resources in one area, and we call it into that box, that we couldn't solve. I do think that people have forgotten how to think for each other and how, how to think individually and common sense. But by uh, kind of eliminating all this other noise and a strong signal in this box between uh, FRS and what we're doing at Westside, we haven't been stumped yet. Could it happen? Plausibly. I don't see it because this uh, constant communication and feedback loop is always there to where when we look internal and we look external, then you create your hierarchy. And I think a strength coach wants to go, well, the answer's in the weight room. It could be. But until you do that assessment, you might have to factor in, hey, you need to do more internal work before you can even do anything externally. And I don't think strength conditioning coaches see that holistically. I do believe they have logistical problems. Back to having 50 or 60 people in a room mm -hmm. and having maybe three or four staff who potentially could do this. I think you have a logistical error that I have no idea how they're going to fix. But on an individual level, I think this is where training is going and has to go. And it's kind of up to us to push how strength coaches, therapists, <clears throat> and strength science to a lesser extent to validate what we're doing. And... Um, yeah, the, the more people can get on board and understand that this is not just a, a fad, because fads come and go all the time. And most of them, as we reviewed some videos of other things yesterday, there's no science. There's no like legitimate, independent, objectable data. It's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. And hearsay can potentially get you a little bit down the line, but there's nothing there. Um, from your guys' travels, and you've worked with many different organizations, is there any common traits you see among these programs that if you had an opportunity to fix, you would? Yeah, one thing that we, we tend to do when we're working with a professional sports organization is we, we always request that if we're doing this, you know, the, an FRC course, or if we're doing an FR course, which is the soft tissue therapy, that we insist that both the therapist and the uh, strength and conditioning staff are present. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we, I mean, it's not even that we try to do it, but when, you, when you're thinking about these things objectively, you realize that we both have the same job. Mm 
right? There's no, there's no difference between what a, a therapist should be doing and what a strength and conditioning person should be doing. If anything, there's not one without the other because I don't believe that a therapist can accomplish anything um, by them, in and of themselves by just doing therapy. So I'll always tell people, if you're going to an office to get therapy, whatever the therapy is, if that person does something to you manually, they put electrodes on you, they rub you, they crack you, they do whatever. If they, if you leave and you're not given specific instructions as to how to actually capitalize on this temporary change in environment that they, that they gave to you, then you're not really accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of progressive adaptation is not only in the weight room. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's how, it's how systems function, right? And, and I always tell people your body, it's not your job of your body to adapt. It's your job, the job of your body to conserve energy. So your body's always going to go towards, you know, the lazier route to conserve energy. Of mm-hmm. course, that's an evolutionary uh, trait that we can't escape from. So effort is involved in all of it. So when you start to see that, you know, that low back case, it, it, it behooves you to, to look at it from both perspectives and to have, you know, the therapist do something so that the, the, the training stimulus actually means something. Mm-hmm. That's the only way to function, right? It's uh, I, I, I'll use an example of, let's say, low back pain. You, you, somebody has any degree of low back pain, the literature is quite clear that you're going to have some dysfunction in the deep lumbar multifidi, right? And when you have dysfunction in deep mar- lumbar multifidi, you'll start to lose uh, slow twitch capacity in those deep, those deep fibers. They start to atrophy. Uh, what usually happens is the therapist kind of gets the person to feel okay with what's happening, right? decreased symptomatology and that person feels okay. And as soon as they feel okay, they're thrown right back into the, the, the stimulus that injured them to begin with. But now because you know every injury leads to anatomical consequences, now you're coming back to that weight room with these anatomical consequences. So now you're asked to deadlift. And the idea is you know, that a deadlift somehow knows that this client has a history of low back pain and that this particular client has a reduction of slow twitch fibers in his deep lumbar multifidi. And now somehow the deadlift is supposed to know to stimulate the deep lumbar multifidi, mm-hmm. which of course it doesn't. A deadlift is an external uh, measure. It's, a, it's something you do in your environment with the tissues you have. But if you're not you know, normalizing the tissue before being put it back into the environment, well, then the number one injury you're going to sustain is the same injury. And you can look at that from any perspective. If you dislocate your left shoulder anteriorly, if I say, what's the number one injury that you're probably going to sustain moving forward? It's going to be another anterior shoulder dislocation. And I think part of the reasons is because we haven't coupled this idea that, you know, the therapy might might start the process, Mm -hmm. but then actual inputs have to be put into that shoulder specific to the exact anatomy that was injured in order to create changes in that anatomy to then normalize the anatomy, if that makes yep. sense. Now, I want to get back to, before we, we move on, I want to get back to what you said about coaches in general. I think we have a, a, a forgetfulness problem where we almost forget what species we're working with. And I always say that in, in a, a strength and conditioning program or in a manual therapy educational program, the fact that evolutionary biology is not a topic which is hammered down into the person immediately is a major problem mm-hmm. because then we start to make believe that things like sports are normal for our species. And, and right there, that's the problem, right? Mm-hmm. It's not normal to play hockey in terms of your anatomy. It's not normal, say, you know, a baseball pitcher. Like back in the days where you're evolving this species, if you picked up a rock and threw it at your prey and the prey died, at, at no time during our evolutionary development was it a good idea to run to the animal, grab the rock, run back 60 feet and then start to throw the rock at the dead animal with curveballs yeah. and sliders repeatedly since the age of five. Like it's not a normal thing to do. So I think people just get humans and they say, well, make humans do this as opposed to saying, well, what is that human, right? Like you have to normalize the person first so that their joints do what they're actually supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And then you can start adding complexity and capacities to those joints and to those tissues. And the idea is, is that if you add more complexity, more capacity to the tissue, the emergence of the external motion will go better. Um, so I wanted to, to point out the idea that there's a, a big difference between the cultivation of self-determination and self-organization. 
And where strength and conditioning is, is all focused on self-organization. I want you to do this in your external environment where what I'm saying is you shouldn't be training organization. You should be training the determinants that then emerge the organization that you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that really it's a perspective change. And as soon as uh, coaches realize that perspective change, I think it makes it a whole lot easier. And it opens it up to the other coaches. So a skill coach should be like, yes, we want this because now we have an athlete that is more open to acquire new and more intricate skills, mm -hmm. which they couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And that's one facet of this that we play little cogs in a big machine in terms of strength conditioning. Like we add force and we're trying to look at a longer perspective. Like if you're a good strength coach, you're not looking at the sport, you're looking at the sport and then life after the sport. Mm. But a skill coach, if we can provide them Uh, an athlete that can acquire more skill when then they're inherently more valuable to themselves, to the organization, to everything. And then we've reduced the risk of injury because injury is what puts most athletes out. And it's always the same thing. Well, I never saw it coming or my knee just gave out. Mm -hmm. Like nothing just, unless it's a catastrophic injury. And these are all kind of to go back to initially what we're talking about with just because you can doesn't mean you should. Athletes, they expect injury. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, different variants, but the fact that in their brain is like, oh, I have to be injured. It's part of parcel, like not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of injuries could be avoided or lessened by implementing the education that you set forth. Mm -hmm. And then by strength coaches understanding like, okay, now I can join these dots and now we can put in external load uh, via ex and exercises drive me nuts is because people have this one special exercise that solves everything. Mm -hmm. Exercises are just tools. And some people react to different ones. Um, you might get more from a different hamstring variation to that. It's again, you're stimulating the body. The tools are going to get it done and you have to have a big selection of them. Like a deadlift is not necessarily the be all and end all, mm -hmm. but it could be, it might, it's up to us as a coach to figure that out. Um, but just to, to bring it back in to the therapist, Why are therapists so afraid to push external load or load in general after a joint injury? Because the vast majority of athletes we get here, they're told, hey, for eight, for maybe three months, don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Just rest and recover. Like, is that a, an accurate thing to do? Because in our assessment, the more movement that they can get back in faster and directed, the quicker they're back out. Mm -hmm. But it seems that that is not the common um, trait for therapists to do. Are you saying that most therapists, you have the impression that it's like rest and relax until everything recovers and then start again? It, there, There's that, but it seems overly extended because I think they're afraid for a malpractice suit. Mm. That if uh, you have a pro athlete who went through a surgery and they've done their job right, well, Like our impression is, okay, well, everything is back together. You're going to have to wait for inflammation to go down. Then, hey, let's start been trending the more aggressive type of rehab. They trend towards little to no rehab. And then the surgeon's ability to talk to the therapist is minimal because some surgeons are way more on our side than they are on the therapist side, but no one gets involved. And at the end of the day, the athlete is there doing nothing. And then we have to go through a whole series of protocols just to regain function. Just say if it's a, if it's a knee, uh, an ACL or an MCL, well, they haven't straightened out that leg properly or it's been in a cast for so long or it's been immobilized for too long. Then they have just went backwards in training by two or three months. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an outcome measure problem again. Uh, I, I think I, education clears all this up. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think once you, you break down what an injury is, And, and, you know, you, you, think it was, you think it was driven into therapies, therapists in their school, what an injury is, um, and, and it's not, because I, I'll, I'll explain that an injury is a mathematical equation, right? The, the load going into whatever tissue being stressed exceeded the load-bearing capacity that that tissue can, can absorb. Um, so if you want to prevent injuries, you have to ri raise the load-bearing capacity. But when someone gets injured from a therapist's perspective, their, their determination as to whether or not they did a good job is whether or not the person feels good. Mm -hmm. But that's not the outcome measure that we should be going towards, right? You dislocate your shoulder anteriorly, there is 
there is a, a specific anatomical consequence to the dislocation of a shoulder, whereby the anterior shoulder capsule is physically torn. Now, if we step back and we go, okay, how is this usually dealt with? Well, it's often dealt with in a way where the therapist is telling you to avoid abduction external rotation. But in my world, that's like saying, well, can you, the, you know, once this is done, in order to prevent yourself from getting injured again, please try not to get injured again, right? Mm -hmm. If you got injured doing this, that means that this stressed that tissue. So if your rehabilitation is not progressively doing this with increasing loads, just like you would find in strength and conditioning, then you're not going to rebuild the actual tissue that was damaged. Mm -hmm. So I think once you put it that way, people start to understand that your job isn't to make people feel good. Your job is to rebuild the tissue back to the level that it was before. That's the, the definition of rehabilitation. But if you want to prevent further injury, you have to take that load bearing capacity and you have to kick it up several notches such that that load, the next time it's put into the body is no longer an issue. So right away, that understanding of Progressive adaptation means that you have to progressively train. Hmm. But you look at someone's rehabilitation program, you look at one person today and they're doing, you know, bird dogs for their low back pain. And I go, well, how many are you doing? I'm doing three sets of 10. You see them three years later and, and you see them on the ground doing bird dogs. And I go, what are you doing? I'm doing three sets of 10. Well, your body doesn't give a shit about three sets of 10. It hmm. hasn't for the last three years. You have to progressively put in load. You have to communicate with those cells in order to make them do something hmm. You know what I mean? So I think understanding is the key. And, and then if you go from the strength person perspective with this external environments, the understanding of dynamic system theory, which is the understanding that when you perform a movement, the next time you perform that movement, it's not going to be performed with the same pattern as the first time. And the time after that, it's not going to be performed with the same pattern as the time before. So this idea that you can hone people into a movement and get them so good at it that there'll never be a consequence is false. Mm -hmm. So think about um, when I worked with NBA teams, I go in there and I look at their strength and conditioning programs and I go, well, where, what's a common injury in, in NBA? Inversion sprains of the ankle. Okay, so where in this strength and conditioning program are you increasing the load bearing capacity of the lateral tissue of the ankle in a progressive fashion, which is known to be, like if you read any of those strength and conditioning books, no one's going to argue that in order to increase load bearing capacity in a tissue, there has to be progressive inputs into that mm -hmm. tissue such that the tissue gets used to bearing, bearing more and more load. So where, in, where is the preventative measures? And what they would point to is, well, we work on balance, right? We work on kind of like just getting our balance right, or we work on the technique mm -hmm. or but that's assuming that things don't go wrong. And clearly things do go wrong. So when you're training an athlete to play basketball, you can't train the ankle to play basketball. You have to train the ankle to be able to withstand all of the potential problems that come with playing basketball, mm -hmm. which means you have to train people out of position purposefully so that when they're forced out of position, then, then they're able to sustain those loads, right? Yeah. So again, we talked earlier about, do people argue? Well, when you put it that way, when you, when you start breaking down what an injury is and, and, and the math of it, and that it's a simple equation, you have to put more load, well, then it starts to make more sense. Oh, okay, so if you tore your lateral ankle tissues, then your rehabilitation has to be first and foremost to guide the way the injured tissue is healing. Mm -hmm. And then second most important thing is to increase the ability for that tissue to resist that load in the future. Well, now you start to make progress in that person. And now you start to see, you know, prevention of injury. Mm -hmm. But you asked originally the, the disconnect between therapy and, and training. I think that's the disconnect. If you, you treat therapy and rehabilitation the way it's always been treated, you're not preparing them to go back into the chaos that is sport. Mm -hmm. You're just preparing them to be comfortable in a seated position, right? You're just bringing them back to, to feeling good and normal. And then you put them back into the training environment and they get injured right away. So what does the therapist learn? The therapist learns that these strength and conditioning guys are, are they're too forceful and it, they're, it's too aggressive and it's too this and it's too that. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if you're the strength and conditioning coach and you're training an MMA athlete, you're trying to develop a monster here. Mm -hmm. And three sets of 10 bird dogs is not going to help you, you know, get up from the bottom or, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So honestly, I think the disconnect is just, um, everyone has to stop and, and first off realize that you're dealing with, 
with an organism that was evolved for a very particular purpose, then you have to assess how far away from the what how the person should be living are they, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to you have to take this evolutionary perspective in mind. What were you evolved to do? Well, arguably we've been in the human form, recent research says for about 300,000 years, which means that for about 300,000 years, like if you take someone from 300,000 years ago, shave them, put them in a three-piece suit and put them in the middle of, of New York City, you won't be able to tell the difference. The physical evolution is kind of halted mm -hmm. for that amount of time. So now you think to yourself, okay, at that time, when the, the genome was being forged, what, what, what was our life? What were we doing? What were the types of things that we had to accomplish? And then you contrast that to how we live today. And you, you start to understand exactly why these things are occurring. Mm -hmm. The further you stray from, from that basis, the further you stray away from health. And that has to do with nutrition, it has to do with training, it has to do with everything. So again, Powerlifting is a good example. I love powerlifting. Obviously, it's a it's a great, but it's not normal, right? <laughs> it's not a normal thing to do. Hunter and gatherers didn't wake up in the morning and go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick up that 300 pound weight and do three by fives. Like that wasn't a thing. <laughs> you move that rock when the rock needed to be moved, and then you utilize your body in a million other different ways throughout the day. But to say that patternizing someone into three movements is not going to come without consequence is just a lack of understanding as to mm -hmm. what species you're actually training. So if you can anticipate those consequences, then like you said, the training becomes easy. So you want to overhead press. Okay, but you only have this much range of motion. So what do you do? You stop training. No, you, you massage the training such that they can put loads into their body within the prerequisites they have. Mm -hmm. And then you build prerequisites. How do you build prerequisites? Training. Like there's no other, there's no device. I can't foam roll my shoulder back into place, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say that some, I can foam roll my shoulder and then, oh, okay, now I have the range of motion. And then people go, okay, that's perfect. But no, but how much experience do you have in that range of motion? Mm -hmm. If your body doesn't allow you to get it without beating it up on a foam roller, then you likely have zero experience between this angle and this angle. Mm -hmm. So just because you beat the shit out of the tissue, and now you can temporarily get into that range of motion, that doesn't mean that once you have load up here, your body has the ability to deal or handle with that load. Mm -hmm. So now you say, okay, you needed 30 more degrees. What do you need in that 30 degrees? You need neurological control of the 30 degrees, because I just said the dynamic systems theory says that every time you put your arm over your head, it's gonna happen somewhat differently. Mm -hmm. So you need to dynamically be able to control that new 30 degrees. How do you resist injury? Well, we just said it's an anatomical, uh, it's a mathematical equation. So you need to increase the load bearing capacity in the newly acquired range such that it can handle the forces. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can say, now you have a range of motion which is suitable to start using that particular stimulus. But that range of motion doesn't come with just passive flexibility training. Nowhere in, the, in research does it say that acquiring something passively will help you actively. Passive uh, inputs equals passive results. Active inputs equals active results. Says the law of specificity, which is the number one governing law in anything that any mm -hmm. of us do, right? So it's, it's a matter of breaking these questions down into their, into their component parts and then understanding the difference between what your body wants to do and what it is doing mm -hmm. and then compensating for that. You just said about, you know, the athlete when they retire. That's another thing that I would go to these pro organizations and I go, okay, what about this training is maintaining the health of the athlete's articulations? Mm -hmm. And then they look at me like I have two heads. Well, what do you mean? They're exercising. Exercise is good for you. I don't know that. I don't know that that's true, mm -hmm. right? I think exercise was invented um, in order to compensate for the fact that we're not living the way we're supposed to live. So general exercise is, is not good for you. Specific exercises that you need are good for you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, I don't even remember the original question, but that was a lot of information, I guess. The, but uh, to build on it is that um, injury rates are not reducing. And there's a reason why. And I think you touched on a lot of that. Another aspect too we have to take into consideration is our standard of living now is so good. Mm -hmm. in that chairs are way more comfy. Oh, yeah. Shoes are like, everything is to an extent 
which potentially you can get away for a longer period of time being a non-athlete mm -hmm. because you're not going through these crazy ranges of motion and exerting force in different areas. But we're seeing it as you get older, well, joint deterioration is high and it's normally the hips and the shoulders, mm -hmm. anywhere that ball and socket is. But for athletes, preventive measures need to be in for everything that we need to understand as coaches that they're going to sit down and get paid a lot of money to play video games. So they might be sitting down for four or five hours a day compared to even 30 years ago where they may have been out training, walking, doing stuff. It's a whole different ball game. And these are other aspects we have to factor in. But I think preventative was the big thing that came out so far is that measures have to be put in place in anticipation of the injuries. And what kind of irks me a little bit is all the advances, advances in technology. Mm -hmm. In football, helmets get better. Everything gets better for impact, but not the athlete's training, mm -hmm. which is bizarre. It's like, why aren't we fixing the injury rates? Why aren't we looking at, well, why are ACLs going out all the time? Why are techs getting torn all the time? Like, these are stuff that can be preventative or reduced, but that's still on the background of, well, we're going to get with Amazon Web Services and give you all this analysis, which makes TV really, really good. But still, the athlete injury rates do not reduce. They go up and up and up. It's, an ex it's a, like we said before, it's external perspective versus yep. internal perspective. If you're making a better helmet, clearly your focus is externally, how can I reduce impact instead of saying internally, how can I absorb impact, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's perspective. It's a perspective problem. It's, it's, a, it's a problem with, with, yeah, it's a problem with not understanding that idea of organization, which happens versus determination, which can be trained. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when training, we, we have access to your movable bits, right? That's what we can train. We yeah. can train your biology and, and that's what you're training. You're not training the movement. You're not training the bench press. You're training, you're using the bench press to train the tissue unless your sport is bench pressing. Yeah. And there's another crazy thing is because in a sport like powerlifting or Olympic lifting, we always talk about this, the skill work and the, and the strength work are coupled, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same thing. But then other people look at it and they go, well, I want to be powerful. So what should I do? Oh, I should do what power lifters do. But you're not a power lifter. You have to separate your skill work from your strength work. Yeah. And it's not, the, it's, not the same, it's not the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And for that, if the 80% of the work you don't see gets that main movement strong, right? They just think, I'm going to get better at benching by bench pressing. We're like, well, that's, that's not the case. Yeah, well, um, you're going to get worse at bench pressing yeah. by bench pressing. Of accommodation. Of accommodation. Yeah. Which, by the way, it's a, it's a big topic that it's another thing I think people get confused about is that, sure, when you're making a strength and conditioning program, you have to cycle the exercises out mm -hmm. and you have to cycle new ones in for the concept of accommodation. That's not, you know, that's not way out there. Everyone seems yeah. to get that. But what people might not understand is that accommodation doesn't happen externally. Accommodation happens internally. Mm -hmm as a result of your anatomy accommodating to whatever it is you're putting it through. But you don't accommodate to things externally. The internal environment, which produces your external movements, yep. is what gets accommodated to. So that's, a, that's another big thing that we have to, we have to understand. It's, um, we're chasing accurate adaptation. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. We're always fine tuning and changing stuff. But back to, like, it has to, as you said, look from the internal outwards. And there has to be this reciprocation, right? Once you gain internal capacity, strengthen them up, then you strengthen external capacities. Now the extra force or extra load you can take externally transfers internally. Mm -hmm. And now you've got, you have the ability to get even stronger because now internally you're getting more. But with one without the other, you're a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. Like am I correct in that thought is that if I just focus on one, there's going to be a, a return rate that's going to get slower and slower or smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And if I focus over here, well, injury rate and everything, and it's just that perfect synergistical relationship, the understanding that you acquire here and you acquire here. Now we can put up more force, more force here. You can probably train internally a lot more aggressively. Mm -hmm. is, and Yeah, it's interesting uh, listening to this conversation because essentially you guys are talking about like the evolution of science, right? And one of the things when the internal strength model was created was we took an evolutionary perspective. So the perspective that Dre is talking about how we have to look at evolution and we have to see how strength training actually evolved. 
<laughs> right? And in, in, in the natural evolution is how it makes sense from a scientific perspective, meaning that essentially what happened was if you look at the basics of physics, right? It started with Newtonian physics, which was the laws of motion that shows us how everything kind of works. But when it goes down to the particle level, it breaks down, mm-hmm. right? And so, and so the natural progression of strength training makes sense to evolve externally and then internally. Mm-hmm. But to solve the issues that strength coaches, therapists, people working to try to uh, elicit some sort of work to change that individual in a positive or favorable manner, they have to have both models. Mm-hmm. Right, like, like there's been a paradigm shift where we, what we're seeing essentially, when you guys discuss the injury rates, is we're seeing a failure of the internal stuff, right? And the biggest thing that we see when we go to these organizations, work with these athletes, all of us have seen this, is when you go, what are you doing for connective tissue architecture or connective tissue load bearing capacity? They go, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And so now when you look at the said principle, mm-hmm. right, and you go, okay, like, how is this connective tissue adapting over time? And there's no specific training work to get it to adapt. It is essentially untrained. Mm-hmm. So you're taking untrained connective tissue into a volatile and chaotic environment. And it's no surprise that that tissue fails. But that's something that, like, like you've been saying, you can really only understand when you understand it from the internal perspective and the external mm-hmm. perspective. Again, I, I go I, I go back to the development of the the understanding of the species, and and I'll, I'll say it I'll say it this way, and this this might be helpful for for people listening. You, your anatomy wasn't proteined for in that, like your bone didn't become your bone because somewhere in the gene it said activate development of bone. Mm-hmm. It, it became bone because of the particular sp- Uh, force profiles that have been put into your tissue. So when a baby is born, for example, their, their, their bones are made of cartilage. When they're born, there's no like gene that says, okay, we need bone now. It's just the way that forces act upon that cartilage that transforms it into bone. So really the only thing protein for in the body, really from a genetic standpoint is what area should spaces be created in your developing cellular blob in order to put joints. Mm-hmm. So there's 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 processes that occur that say, well, a shoulder should go somewhere here and a hip should go here and a knee should go here. And then following that, movement and, and, and the absorption of forces through movement, um, they create your anatomy. So in other words, whatever force profile was put into your tissue, that will determine what your tissue will become. Mm-hmm. Strength training should be you trying to match a particular force profile to the particular anatomy you're trying to create. And the force profile to create more muscle proteins is not the same force profile that would make you better quality connective tissue. There are conditions, there are strategies that you can use that says, I'm going to focus on the red stuff, the muscle stuff, Mm -hmm. versus I'm going to focus on the white stuff, the connective tissue stuff, versus I'm going to focus on the, the space itself, the articulation, versus I'm gonna focus on the neurology. So I just laid out four uh, ecologies that need to be maintained throughout a person's existence. If one ecology is supported at the expense of the other three, then then that would be where your problem is. And what John is saying is that there's been this, this huge focus on nervous system function and muscular training at the expense of connective tissue support and the development of good articulations mm-hmm. and joints. And you said something earlier about, you know, when people retire, um, it's important that they stay healthy. Forget that. Let's pretend that you only care about performance. You're a high school strength coach or you're a, you know, a college. If you only care about performance, well, the fact of the matter is we're, we care about the same thing because the, the articulation, the health of the articulation dictates how well it communicates with your central nervous system. Like the way that your brain understands Mm -hmm. your shoulder is by the signals that your shoulder sends to your brain. And your signals are being sent by anatomy, real biology. So if you have shitty quality biology, 
you're going to have shitty quality signaling to the central nervous system. And if you have shitty quality signaling to the central nervous system, you're for sure not going to be able to emerge complex mm -hmm. and adaptable movements in your external environment, right? So if I give you two baseball pitchers and I say, these, both these guys can pitch a 90 mile an hour fastball and I want you to bring them up to a 92 mile an hour fastball. And I go to the first guy and I say, okay, well, what, what can your shoulder do? Just show me, a, show me what your shoulder's capable of. We do something called CARS, as you know, controlled articular rotations, which is a demonstration of a person's ability to work, to move through an entire workspace. So we get the person to move and they start to kind of move like this and then they start to go like that and then they wince and then they kind of fake their shoulder here and they come around and like that. And you go, okay, well, give me your history of injuries. Well, I've torn my rotator cuff. I have a slap labral tear that I got from da 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 mm -hmm. that I had surgery on, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go to the next athlete. Show me what you got. This guy gives you a beautiful workspace, which seems to be completely under control, mm -hmm. ample amounts of range of motion. You ask about their history and they say, yeah, I, I've not had an injury. If I ask you, who would you rather work with, right, in order to get that 92 mile an hour fastball? Or who would you rather work with to maintain health after? Yeah. It's the same answer. Yeah. It's the same answer because the first guy's tissues, the receptors, afferents, the, the information coming from your tissue to your brain, it comes from tissue that is slightly altered in order to send signal, like mm -hmm. a muscle spindle. It's just a, a muscle fiber slightly altered by a few proteins in order to send signal. But if you tear muscle, you reduce the amount of afferents coming from that muscle. And the less afferents is less information, less information, less complexity, mm -hmm. then you can't learn your skill anyway. So we're, we're working for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if we understand that, it employs people even more to say, well, no, we need a healthy shoulder first. So what does a healthy shoulder look like? Well, there's four ecologies that mm -hmm. we just said have to be maintained. They have to be developed. If one of the ecologies has been ignored, as John said for all this time, well, that's where you put your work. We all know that untrained things, if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, find something that's not trained and train it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get huge uh, jumps. But that's a major issue where the muscular system is, is driven to a, in athletes, you have a muscular system that's overdriven. You have a neurology system that's just overdriven. And then you have good quality muscle pulling into shitty quality connective <clears> tissue. <throat> and then the connective tissue blows up and everyone's like, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Of course you know what happened right? You were not matching force profiles. And we, we have a unique situation with professional athletes in that their genetics and skill level pull them through in what people perceive as competency, right? That guy is an amazing player. That lady is a phenomenal player. Mm -hmm. Well, then internally or from like, they're barely functioning. Yep. And you're like, okay, then injury happens. And, and obviously every year statistics go up in injury rate because they're asked more in their sport and they're doing more extraordinary measures. But that's the skill and genetics that got them there. How much better could they get if we could acquire more with them? I think a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. um, I have yet to, I, I think we're batting about 95% of pro athletes that come in here nearly have the same issues. Mm -hmm. It's always hips, like no hips, no nothing. And they're, it's slowly creeping in and that we have people who usually externally have coaches that are identifying these issues. But I think it's a lack of education on the viewer to go, oh, well, why would they want to do that? Or like someone blocks uh, a player. I, I go back to like torn pecs drive me nuts in football. Like you can train for that. You call the buffer. We call it outside of the groove to where um, we can understand that these inputs are going to happen. So if you're not loading force into correct joints and uh, accounting for the fact that, hey, it's professional sports, stuff happens outside the norm, well then, of course, all these things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. But the fact that strength and conditioning is still relatively new, right? 1975, 76, That's when the first big, big point. professional yep. strengthening comes in, mm -hmm. I think people got locked in, this literature must be it. Mm -hmm. And then they do an internship and like, this is how I learned because this is what my mentor, and I can understand that aspect but back to, they forget to think, like we have to advance training and by advancing training, we're making it way simpler mm -hmm. in that we're actually giving you a strategy of hierarchy to do. Um, what, uh, what mechanisms do you guys go through if you get a pro athlete? 
So if you have a pro athlete comes to you, do you have a sequence that you start with? Uh, th no, but well, yes, of course. There's 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 a sequence. They they the person, but the sequence isn't different from from any other person, right? Yep. If if a, an pro athlete comes in, and let's say again, let's just take a baseball pitcher. I'm gonna well, it doesn't matter who it is. I'm gonna run them through what I call a functional range assessment. And to sum up a functional range assessment is I'm going to objectively observe um, your ability to move through your workspaces, mm -hmm. which is what we call controlled articular rotations, which are uh, joint motions that force the person to explore their entire um, availability of motion. That's mm -hmm. what a workspace is. So I'm going to watch the person move in order to try to see how they've built in compensations for things that they're unable to do. Like you said about athletes, athletes are amazing compensators. So uh, a lot of athletes can get away with a lot of things just because they're athletes. Now, I don't think that, like, I think you were alluding to this, that the people who make it to the majors aren't necessarily the people who have the best anatomy. It's the people who could put up with the most bullshit, right? So their tissues just so happen to be able to, to put up with all those stresses. Mm -hmm. But to look at that person and go, well, what did he do? I want to do the same thing. That's a huge, that's a huge error, mm -hmm. right? That's a complete omission of everything we just said previously, which is every individual comes to you with a collection of capacities and problems. And, and you can't just generically say, I'm gonna train like this person because you're not that person. Mm -hmm. that it's, it's not the, how that works. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I have to know what the person's capable of before I can program. And I don't mean show me how, how much you can lift. Who cares how much you can lift? I, do, I mean, what can your joints do? So I run what we call a full functional range assessment where I take every single articulation and I run it through its passive range of motions as well as its active ranges of motions. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, it, if you have a, a large passive range of motion, um, but you only have a small amount of active range, that means you have a lot, if you have, let's say 180 degrees of a split, but you can only bring your leg up to 90 degrees. That means you have 90 degrees of motion, which you're unable to produce or absorb energy. And if we just said that all injury prevention is the ability to absorb load, well, that's 90 degrees of, of no man's land, mm -hmm. right? So I have to know these numbers. And then once I have these numbers, I know where to go with training because my intent is to make those things, those joints function well, to give the person active abilities in their passive, at least try to capture as much of the passive range as mm -hmm. I can, right? From just a general perspective of health and function, once I have a shoulder that I think is function, it functions well as a human shoulder, then I can decide to fuck it up with sport. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? But because I know how the sport's gonna mess it up, I know how to preemptively build tissue to be able to support that, that the stresses of that sport. Mm -hmm. Take a, an elbow, Tommy John injuries. Why are they so common in baseball pitchers? Because you're baseball pitchers and it's not a normal thing to do. So what can I do to prevent it? Build yourself a hell of a, a medial joint capsule in that mm -hmm. elbow. So with the athletes that, that, that come into us, it starts off relatively the same, whereby I break them down into their, their prerequisites and to their capacities. And then you start to pick and choose what, what lack of capacity do they, do, uh, like what prerequisites do they not have for their sport? Mm -hmm. We start to build there. That's not to say that we don't continue to train them. Going back to the misconceptions of how I deal with athletes, a lot of people might think that I look at the athlete and go, all your joints suck. You shouldn't be doing any of your training, which is crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Of course you let them train. But just knowing that these things need to be worked out, worked on in time is it puts you way ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. So then it's just a matter of, I look at it from an internal perspective first, what am I dealing with? And then I look externally, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. and, and, and those are the two things. It doesn't matter what kind of athlete. I consider every human being, I consider an athlete because at one point, 300,000 years ago, you were either an athlete or you were a, a hindrance to your tribe or yeah. you were dead. Um, so I don't see the difference between athletes and, and humans. Mm -hmm. um, and in the way that we deal with them, of course, there's differences at the at the high level, um, but generally, you have to look at it the exact same way. And it doesn't get complicated until you reach the prerequisites that you need just to be regular human guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Given the age that children begin sports, mm -hmm. and given the frequency, like baseball is a great example. Yeah. It doesn't stop. Yeah. There's no seasons. Yeah. 
should um, this be implemented earlier? So should we have things set up in high school that at least they have a basic understanding like, hey, this is how you can prevent injuries going on with these kids? Are we catching it too late by if we get them when they're older? Best way I can explain this. I put, uh, I have three, three kids, right? So I put them in gymnastics early. I always say that your kids should be, you know, they, they should be in, in movement heavy activities. So gymnastics or dance or martial arts that are he movement heavy, mm -hmm. right? That simulate play. But the first thing I told my wife with regards to gymnastics is I said, as soon as they make them land and then put their arms up like this for points, you know what I mean? Like yep. they land yep. and I'm pulling them out of gymnastics, right? Because what I want them to do is I want them to explore the environment. I want them to play. I want them to function like normal humans would have functioned. <laughs> as soon as civilization takes hold, which happens earlier and earlier now, that's the exact point where I believe that this type of methodology should be started. Mm -hmm. Because the methodology is in place, uh, if you get it early enough, to continuously maintain their articulations in time. And if we get back to what I was talking about with the, de the development of joints, all decisions made by the central nervous system can be brought back to what is the status of the space mm -hmm. between those two bones? What is the status of the joint? So as soon as you start to um, patternize people, which is what you're referring to, uh, the forcing people into patternized motions. The reason why we have problems over here in time is because you can, anatomical tissue can only adapt so much. There are upper limits as to how much adaptation particular lines or tissues can, mm -hmm. can, can, uh, can occur. And as soon as you run past those lines, that's when the, comp the compensatory mechanisms start to, to come into place. So, the idea of patternizing is the main problem. The mm -hmm. idea that I'm going to make you into a bench press, a bench presser solely. Well, the problem with that is, is that there's no such thing as a muscle, right? Muscles are not one thing. They're thousands of things. So if you take a muscle and you take it in cross section, you can, theoretically, you can say, okay, well, the bench press, what part of the pec really, at, at a, for a flat bench, what part of the pec is really focused on? And you can circle, you know, some, some motor units, these ones, these ones, these ones, and these ones. And the next time you sit down to, you lie down to bench, mm -hmm. especially if you have a trainer in your ear, confining the variables of the motion, because that's what a trainer does. Mm -hmm. When I tell you, no, you didn't bench properly, you need to bench like this. What I'm doing is I'm artificially confining the variables of motion so that I make the patternization even stronger, mm -hmm. right? So now you have these tissues are, are, are trained, these tissues, these tissues. The other tissues are not trained, right? Because you're continuing the same pattern. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you run out of the ability to, comp to, to adapt those tissues. You can't indefinitely adapt those tissues. And then when those tissues start to explode, you start to rely on other tissues that are untrained, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of patternization is a major problem, and it runs back to the lack of understanding of the dynamic uh, nature of the system in that, you, you know, you can patternize yourself to play a particular, uh, to do a particular thing, a skill or an external thing, but you have to support the internal system, not in a patternized way, because internally the movements don't always occur the same. They're very chaotic. So that means you just have to support the system itself that produces the external, uh, thing that you want to produce. Now, that doesn't mean you don't bench press. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't, you don't specialize. But it does mean that unless your training has a support mechanism for the, the person in and of themselves, the running of pattern training will only lead to injury eventually or plateaus, whichever mm -hmm. one comes first. You're either going to hit an upper limit of weight where you go, I can't break whatever bench press barrier it is, right? I can't get past that. Well, that's because you've squeezed the juice out of the anatomy that you've been using, yeah. right? So the idea of, of opening up the anatomy, the idea of finding new space to work with, right? We always say, if you give, if you do an FRA on someone's hip, so I check internal rotation, external rotation, flexion, extension, check all of those ranges of motion. You put them into a squatting program, right? Six weeks from now, all you're doing is you're squatting or you're doing these, the accessories to a squat that mm -hmm. you would do for squatting. If I rerun the FRA 
I'm going to get a reduction in, in very specific ranges. Mm -hmm. Why? Accommodation. You've told the body, this is what you want to do with it. So you're going to start to get less and less articular joint space with which to do it. And that's going to focus the, the, the strain of that training into the same tissues over and over where you hit these upper limits of adaptation and then they explode, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're constantly trying to cultivate more control, more availability of movement with which to create solutions to the movement problems you're presenting, such that every time I bring a lifter to the squat rack, I'm bringing a new lifter. I got you. Yep. And if you bring a new lifter to every time you squat, then the, the problem of accommodation flies out the window mm -hmm. because this person is, is, is not the same thing. So it's not like they're changing to the squat. I'm cultivating the person to be able to squat. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned less with the organization or the display of the squat, which may be the goal. And I'm caring more about the determinants that allow the emergence of the squat to come through. That's not to say you don't squat. That's mm -hmm. not to say you ignore external training, but there has to be a, a focus on the internal cultivation of the athlete on an ongoing basis to be able to do that. We, you take something as easy as, well, if you look at the, the evolution of any joint in the periphery other than your spine, if you, if you study the anatomy from an evolutionary anat anatomical perspective, every joint outside the spine you're going to have the space. Then you're going to have connective tissue capsule that defines the space. The next layer out is always going to be rotational muscle that influences the capsule that influences the space. Mm -hmm. And then if you go another layer out, you're going to find long linear muscles, right? And, and that's how it goes in the spine. It's, it's different. So I asked people, well, when was the last time you put actual work into preventing the entropy or breakdown of the deep rotational tissues that actually govern the space, which then governs information flow to the central nervous system? And the answer is the last time I got injured. You only see people doing rotator yeah. cuff work when they get injured. So when you're injured, you somehow know that that tissue is important. Mm -hmm. Then when it feels better, you go back to strength and conditioning land, which is all about linear motions. It's all bench press or any of these named motions. And then in time, we know that entropy or the breakdown of tissue from an organized state to a disorganized state is happening all the time. But if you're only supporting your external tissue, you're doing it at the expense of your internal tissue. Your internal tissue is the afferent tuner, the mm -hmm. thing that actually hones what is happening in the joint space, which is really what your brain cares most about. So you have external tissue being developed, internal tissue breaking down, and then you're going to have neurological problems. Not to mention the fact that even if you take the external tissue that people train, mm -hmm. they're really only training the muscular tissue, the red stuff. Well, how do you say that? Because the force profile of constantly moving through a set is training the ability for proteins to move past each other. That's a, a muscle focus, right? But doing that is not gonna place enough stress in connective tissue to make connective tissue changes mm -hmm. in that linear tissue. So not only do you have to look at what level of tissue are you training, but you also have to look at the tissue and you have to say, which components of the tissue am I actually getting? And if you break that down, all we're doing is training external muscle. Mm -hmm. my hamstrings, even the names of exercises are named after the, you know, pec deck yep. or, you know, a hamstring curl. It's just this continuous focus on the same thing over and over and over and over again that leads to the deterioration of everything you're ignoring. But you have to understand the anatomy of that. Like there, there has to be a realization of the evolutionary perspective of all this in order to say, oh shit, that probably is important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what's not being done. And I want I, I, to go back to a thing before, the idea that just getting strong is, is, is enough, would, you would not see these increased sports injuries. You would not see the, the uh, increased amount of osteoarthritis that's occurring. You mm -hmm. can literally track that back to evolution. And you can say, well, this is the point where osteoarthritis starts to skyrocket. And, and what's that point? That's the, the onset of human civilization where being human, all of a sudden, the definition changed into doing these repetitive tasks over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see this drop-off. So this idea that everything's going to be okay, just get strong, 
work through your injuries, you know, the same way you got the injuries. I mean, that's the definition of crazy, right? If you mm -hmm. put a stimulus in and it injures the person, then you rehabilitate that person back to the state that they were before and you put them back mm -hmm. into the same environment. Well, of course you should expect a re-injury. Like, that, that doesn't even make any sense. They, they clearly didn't have the capacity to sustain what you were doing. Now they've healed to the same way they were before, which means they still don't have that capacity, right? The cycle continues. The cycle continues. Mm -hmm. And then the therapist says it's the trainer's fault and the trainer says it's the therapist's fault, but it's really the fault of the internal system. It doesn't yeah. have what you think it has. It doesn't have the capacities because you've been working in the external environment. What's the next exercise I should do? What pattern thing should I train the body to do? Instead of saying, how can I use exercise to influence tissues specifically? If I want to increase the resilience of connective tissue, there's very specific ways. You want to train that connective tissue to length or at length, because length under force is a predetermined prerequisite for the development of connective tissue. Mm -hmm. It trains at length. So if you're just doing mid-range movement exercises and you're never stressing that, that white tissue, your red tissue eventually is going to exceed the force absorption capacity of your white tissue and then injury. And like you were saying, what are the types of injuries that we see in professional athletes? It's white stuff injury. It's mm -hmm. connective tissue injury, first and foremost. Uh, I love the term control yourself. Mm. Because to me, it means it's very open-ended in a sense. But from an athlete's perspective, you can see their competency and understanding their body has gone up exponentially. Mm -hmm that they now have a level of education to understand the signals their body has been given them. I think a lot of the time we're so numb to our body sending us the warning signs mm -hmm. that having that level of control knows what you can and can't do. And that's another thing that will help. And I think coaches from strength perspective need to understand that the idea of a coach is you're trying to make someone better than yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can give them a level of uh, physical literacy that they understand themselves way better than they once thought, then you've succeeded as a coach. And everything's multifaceted. It's not just get strong. Well, get strong where and why and what. What is strong yeah, is the question. That's yeah. it. And it's uh, we got this nomenclature where it crosses over, means multiple different things from commentators, education, the person watching to athletes been taught by the coaches, a therapist talks about differently. There's not really a solid universal written language because again, strength multifaceted, but by looking at this way through internal to external, it is universal, mm -hmm. which everyone can understand it. An athlete doesn't need to understand the scientific principles, but they need to understand the feeling. The coach understands what the athlete is feeling. And now you've just created an even better feedback loop that an athlete can tell you, hey, this is what I'm feeling. And you're like, oh, before you got into this system, you had no idea what that feeling was. Mm. And yeah. I think that's a huge part for the development of training and of athletes and of people in general and that feedback loop continues and i keep going back down to this box now the athlete is part of this whole system because they're giving you such accurate feedback because they understand how to control themselves and where they're feeling they're losing control you're like okay now we've got more data that's objective to put in the system mm -hmm. um where do you guys see the future like where do you see this like from what you're doing uh where are your next steps Hmm. That's a good question. You have, you have anything? Um, I think that this is uh, when when we think about the evolution. So one of the lectures that we give is on the evolution of strength and strength training so that you can understand the past and you can understand the future. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when when we look at the evolution of strength and strength training, just like we look at the evolution of physics, we see it'll happen externally first, laws of motion. But then when we start to break it down to the particle level, and the, you know, that physics breaks down. And we know that since 1920s, you know, it took, I mean, you know, 10, 20 years for quantum physics to start to actually become a part of mm -hmm. accepted, let's say. So there was, a, there was that phase of that. I see it the same way. I see that, you know, the natural consequence that we came to in working with all the pro athletes that we work with, right? What did we see, right? So what we saw was the athletes that all came to us were not high-performing athletes. They were all injured, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? 
So unfortunately, it wasn't until this year that we started to acquire healthy athletes, right? Because of that learning curve. Now that took about five years, right? But now we're actually getting access to athletes that are not actually injured mm -hmm. and aren't reaching out to us. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I can start to see progression in like our business and how now we're acquiring athletes mm -hmm. at ages where we can actually build the physical capacities that they need. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that the future is kind of already here and we can use the feedback mechanism of FRS with all the people that attend the seminars, the, the, the people that attend multiple seminars that start to utilize specifically that system at the internal level. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, I'm optimistic. So I think the, the future is, is good. I think that uh, what happens is if, you know, you know, you talk about like your toolbox and your toolkit, right? Like if you have an internal issue with the athlete and you're using an external method or external means, right? You're gonna continuously run into a wall. Mm -hmm. And you know, from a business perspective, like you're not gonna be able to pay the bills doing that. So I think that, I think that more and more uh, strength coaches are understanding that. I think that it's starting to see a paradigm shift where people kind of are maybe understanding the difference between internal strength training, external strength training, seeing how they both have to coexist how they have to figure out how to sequence them and run them in parallel. I do think that is here because of the feedback that we've already got, not just from athletes, mm -hmm. right? And, and I mean, we know this with athletes that, that we work with, right? Is as soon as you start to run the internal system, the athlete wants more of it. Case mm -hmm. in point, you remove the internal training and the athlete will go, why did you remove this? Mm -hmm. Right. And so like that's non-biased feedback. Right. Because the athlete starts to understand why they're doing that input. And then the removal of that specific input could be the removal of a very specific capacity that they know they have to have for sport. So I think the future is, is going to be to continue to essentially, uh, you know, teach internal strength training to have people come up with a system of external strength training that is highly effective and efficient to enable to create all of the training effects that are needed at that level. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to merge those two systems together uh, in an optimal manner to, to essentially uh, put the athlete in a position where they are going to be most successful, but also healthy and high functioning. I'm going to go with that answer. I mean, that was a good one. I think, um, I think the good news is, is that I've never had a room full of, of strength coaches who, at the end of this type of discussion, were like, well, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we all started from this, this, this same history of, you know, performance-based outcome measures. We need to get more gold medals. We need more of this. We need more of that. Um, and if we just step back and start to analyze what we're doing from, from this perspective, it, the conclusion kind of makes itself, right? Like, if you can't put your arm over your head, then don't don't put your arm over your head with load, mm -hmm. right? If you're if you're doing a low bar back squat, there's a certain amount of ankle dorsiflexion that is just a minimal requirement, and which is different than a, a, a high bar back squat, which is different than a front squat. So stick to what you're able to do first, and then use training as a as a means of acquiring capacities that unlock other options for training, right? Mm -hmm. And and another good, the other good news is that I, I, this can be explained using, like I said, the same physiological principles that everyone understands from strength training from a performance perspective. Like the things don't change. Where I think people might get a little worried is they think that you're going to lose intensity of training somehow. Like, like you know, mobility stuff is just like, uh, it's just the stuff you do for your warm up before you start. Well, come train with me. It's it's it, you'll be begging for deadlifts, right? Like when you just take the intensity that you use in a deadlift and you redirect uh, that intensity to a specific anatomical structure, and maybe we do an isometric effort at length in order to build connective tissue, you're going to be working just as hard as if you're doing a like max efforts, max effort, mm -hmm. right? It, max effort's not a thing that is owned by a particular movement in the external environment, right? Mm -hmm. Deadlifting is the best exercise. Well, it is because it it really makes people work hard, right? And your endocrine system, it, it, it works on the, the currency of intensity, right? So 
when people come and they realize that what we're, we're saying is not that you should work less, you should actually work smarter and at more intensity with less volume, which mm -hmm. is something that we never, never talked about. There's a whole volume issue with this yeah. too, which is very readily handled by taking an internal perspective. Uh, but once you realize that it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's like when Lou took, you know, the Soviet research and then he kind of adapted and the, the conjugate method came out. It's very difficult to argue that method, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. it's very difficult or I haven't run into someone who can sit there and, and give me literature to back up an argument that goes against that methodology. Well, if you take that methodology and you just go one step further, not at the gross tissue level, but into the cellular level, which I think is what you were alluding to is that physics, for example, um, theoretical physicists, they have this, uh, this thing, well, you know, you, you, you think in the, the level that you're able to think depending on what is known in the literature. So you go from Newtonian mm -hmm. physics and then you go into the, you know, quantum realm and you go into string theory or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they try to get to the deepest level that is understood. The deepest level that we understand is the cellular function of human of the human body. This, what cells do? How do cells respond? So if you bring it out of the your hammies are on fire or mm -hmm. my hammies are tight, what the hell's a hammy? Like what are you? Yeah. What exactly are you saying? You can replace these words with words at a cellular level, and if you start there and apply the same things that we know, but this time to the cellular level. It, it tells you what to do. It guides what you, what you need to do. And you don't lose anything on the back end in terms of intensity. And, and you're not, yeah, I want to make people lift more too. Like people think I just, just try to keep them safe. I want mm -hmm. you to walk around with, 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 uh, you know, padding around you so that, well, no, I have to, I have to take these athletes and they want me to make them better at athletes. So it doesn't end at normalizing the anatomy and making them human. Then you have to push capacity. And you have to push it hard and you have to push it progressively. Mm -hmm. So the people over here in strength training world and the people over here in therapy world, it's the, it's the same, man. It's just forces in, forces out. When I do force uh, application as a therapist, I, I can only speak force. When you do force application as a strength coach, you can only speak force. Mm -hmm. We know how forces affect tissue. We know it, at, a, at a very specific tissue level from a cellular level. So if we just take those and use those as the guiding principles, um, I, I think that's where the future goes, mm -hmm. where we learn to first and foremost control yourself, right? That, that, that's what the, you know, the number one job is to learn how to control the person. Mm -hmm. And I've never run into a coach that says, I don't want my athlete to have more control over themselves. I've, I've never met that person. You can do too much with regards to strength training. Like we talk about this all the time. If you're a, a, a martial artist, we talked about this yesterday, actually, if you're a, a you know, you're, you're the lightweight, you know, 155 pounds, you don't need to bench press 500 pounds, man. Like you need to be able to control your body weight plus their body weight, plus a little bit more. So there's upper boundaries of mm -hmm. traditional strength requirements. And then once you acquire those upper boundaries, which is not hard to do if you're using a good a good methodology to do it, then you need to learn how to work backwards and match the speed profile of the sport to that strength, mm -hmm. right? You know, Lou is famous saying strength is speed, speed is strength. I don't mm -hmm. know if people really understand what that means. Like you only need your nervous system to be able to drive as much force as is necessary. And then you have to take that force and you have to chop it up into speed profiles. And that's what an athlete is. The difference between a baseball player and a basketball player is their, their ability to execute speed in very specific situations. So once we start to break down athletes like that, um, and we realize that the health of the athlete is going to uh, affect their performance, mm -hmm. I honestly think that if, if, you, if, if we all have that honest conversation, that there's no chance of not going in this direction. You know, it might not be exactly what the things that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we provide a way of doing this, which is pretty solid. Like we've been doing it for a lot of years. But I think that in the future, we're going to look back at what we did and we're going to go, huh, fuck, we were just paying attention to the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Like we knew what we were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing it to and why. And, and that speaks to, the, um, to the, the, the youth of the profession, right? We're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of years of data. It's like the soft tissue thing. Like we only have soft tissue research in like 40 years maybe. Yeah. And, and, and all of that research, again, I would argue was, was at the wrong 
topic. It was mm-hmm. at the wrong level. It was thinking about my hamstrings are tight. How do I untighten them? Which really doesn't make sense from a cellular perspective. But once you get deeper and more knowledge comes out, I don't see any any other direction it can go. I think I think athletes are driving it in this direction though too. Right? Like you've you've discussed this, right, with COVID. It's it's interesting like athletes with talking about the professional level, right? The athletes now have access to hire their own strength coach. Yeah. Right? Well, it's back to control yourself. Athletes are controlling more. Yeah, exactly. of their own futures. And they understand that there is a level of responsibility that their franchise can provide them. But at the end of the day, it's like being a fighter, you have to protect yourself. Yeah. So they're more the more control an athlete has, and I like when you said that everyone can be treated as an athlete, which is the truth, mm-hmm. to where this is not just affecting just athletes, it's affecting everyone at certain points. Um, before we wrap up, if you have a coach or anyone wants to find out more information, where would they go? Uh, well, our website is functionalanatomyseminars.com. Uh, and there you will see th- there's information on the on the systems, obviously. Um, to, to review the systems, there's the, the soft tissue kind of um, avenue where we have the functional range release, which teaches you about anatomical palpation, the, the where, why, how of feeling tissue, mm-hmm. making decisions, making decisions as to how to input force into the tissue to make changes. Um, then we have what we call functional range assessment, which is the, what we were talking about earlier about taking the, 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 it, we keep saying athlete because we're in, in this environment, yeah. but taking whoever the person yeah. is and, and breaking them down into what they can and cannot do. That would be the, the functional range assessment. Um, the functional range conditioning of course is, is really focused on the idea of expanding space where necessary and controlling the space that you have. Mm -hmm. We have something called kin stretch, which we haven't brought up yet, which is a body practice, which by the way, controlling yourself means practicing yourself and practicing a sport is not practicing yourself. Mm -hmm. Like there's a way that you can continuously practice your shoulder, um, which is not the same as throwing a baseball, right? Baseball practices a pattern, whereas you can practice yourself, that's the kin stretch. And then we have this um, this internal strength model, which is looking to increase specific capacities as is necessary, depending on how the person uses that bo- uh, their body. Um, so there's that methodology on the website. You can mm-hmm. learn about those those seminars. I have a podcast too called the Control Yourself Podcast, um, which we usually speak to um, other instructors and mm-hmm. practitioners about how we function. Of course, we're on I'm on Instagram. Just look up my name and. We we'll put links below too. Links, yeah, yeah. But there's enough. There's enough of me out there to make you sick if you want it. Um, but yeah, that's how. I would. Well, I greatly appreciate the time, and I hope this is the first of many because I do believe there is a wide-ranging amount of topics we can go into. But, gentlemen, thank you. Mm-hmm.